In America, we have been taught never to give up. Never to give up. From Davy Crockett's last stand at the Alamo to the special forces unit trapped in the urban jungle of Somalia's war-torn cities, now immortalized in the movie Black Hawk Down, we don't quit. From Charles Lindbergh's gutsy crossing of the Atlantic to the New York City firefighters' courageous efforts to save victims after the 9-11 attack. We don't quit. Here in the USA, we admire those who don't quit. We admire those who fight until the last round of ammo, who don't give up under any circumstances, even when facing death, these are our heroes, the ones that never quit. Whether it be baseball or bombs, Americans never surrender. It's no wonder then that we're having a problem internalizing the principal teaching of the Christian faith and that is total surrender to Christ. You see the problem? Our religion is in direct opposition to our social ideals and this causes great distress. On one hand, we are taught and reminded incessantly that in this society, only the strong survive. The only place to be is to be number one. Number two doesn't even count. In business, in sports, in politics, we actually applaud the survivor. There's even a show called Survivor even if that survivor acts improperly. We admire them if they withstand the protest over their actions and they carry on nevertheless because this guy is a survivor, he doesn't quit, he doesn't apologize, he doesn't submit. I mean, you know, this is not a political statement that I'm making here, it's just a historical one, but the best example of this is several years back, former President Bill Clinton if you remember back then, his favorability ratings actually went up even after it was proven that he had acted immorally and recklessly and dishonestly. It seemed that people admired him because he wouldn't quit. He wouldn't apologize for his bad behavior. It's as if the nation was channeling its rebellious streak through him and thumbing its nose at the principle of law and propriety that rule over all working societies. You know, what he did was wrong, yeah, but man, he didn't quit. He didn't knuckle under. We don't like quitters. We don't like to submit. And we will champion any scoundrel that vicariously lives out this rebellion on our part. We even have music that celebrates this spirit. If you didn't notice it, it's called rock and roll. I think in country music they have a thing called outlaw country, something like that, where we celebrate the rebel, the guy that breaks the rules. The girls now are making songs. You know, they're the baddest girl. You're running with the fastest girl. Of course, this is the attitude that we have been cultivating in the last hundred years. And it has worked for us in bringing us to being a superpower, the only superpower. Now the only problem with this is that this type of conditioning makes it very hard for us to grow as Christians. We like to separate that. Well, I'm an American over here and then my Christianity, well that's a whole other thing. And it's not really a whole other thing. You see, the Christian religion is based on the concept of surrender. If you didn't get that idea from all the songs that Harold was leading, <laughs> all to Jesus, not some to Jesus, all to Jesus. And what do I do? All to Jesus, I lend him for a while. No, the song says, all to Jesus I 
Surrender. What does it mean to surrender? The word surrender means that one gives up in defeat. You are beaten. You are defeated. In war, one side realizes that it's going to lose. And so in order to save casualties, they admit defeat. And they give up their struggle. They surrender. Now nothing could be further from the American mindset in the year 2013. And yet, nothing comes closer to God's will for man than the concept of surrender, of admitting defeat and giving in to Him. Every day we struggle to make a living. We struggle and fight to provide a home and to build some kind of security for ourselves. We think about it, we stress over it, we overextend our time for it, we neglect our health for it, our families, our church. To do what? To win this daily battle. And yet the Lord says to us in Matthew 6.25 exactly the opposite. He says, do not be anxious for your life. Do not be anxious for your life. I can't confirm this, obviously, uh, I mean from experience, but I have read that the majority of um, the majority of the problems that people bring into doctors' offices can be reduced down to the effects of stress on their life. High blood pressure, and nerves, and headaches, and pains, and aches, and all kinds of imbalances in the body. Due to stress over what? Keeping up, making out, making the thing, you know, sizing up, keeping up, uh, 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 making sure everything runs okay, not quitting, winning, keeping the pace. And yet Jesus says to Christians, do not be anxious for your life. In our spiritual lives we battle to be better. We fight to be free from sin. We worry about the world to come and if we're actually going to make it to heaven. Nothing sadder than a person who's been a Christian 20, 30, 50 years and you say, so how do you feel about heaven? And they say, well I hope I'm going to make it. What? You hope you're going to make it? I mean, if you're only six months into the Christian faith, I get it if you're saying that. But if you're into the Christian faith 60 years and you're still saying, well, I, I hope I'm going to make it, I got my fingers crossed, what? The Lord says in Matthew 11, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and what will I do? I'll make it worse, I'll add to the burden. No, he says, come to me, those of you who are heavy laden, who are burdened, who are anxious. And he says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble. Does that sound like the world to you? Gentle, humble? Does that sound like your boss? Gentle, humble? And yet the Lord said, come to me, I'm gentle and humble of heart. And what will you find with me, he said? You will find rest for your souls. Seems to me that if we're not at rest in our souls, maybe we're not yoked with Jesus. You ever think about that sometimes? And in our ministries, we work hard to build you know, our turf, our area. Never quit on expanding and producing results, engaging conflict sometimes with someone if it th threatens our position or our plans. Imagine, imagine two brothers fighting with each other in order to do the Lord's work. Think about that. <laughs> Saying nasty things about each other because they don't agree on how something should be done for God. And yet, the Bible says in Philippians 2 that Jesus 
even though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. You know one of the things I don't see very often in the church, and I, I wish I did, but I don't, is a debate between a brother and sister, or a brother and brother, or sister and sister. No, let me serve. No, no, I want to serve. No, no, I'll do it. I'll, I'll serve. No, let me clean the floor. Let me mop the floor. You did it last week. I want to do it this. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? No, I want to take the afternoon off on Sunday and I want to be the one to go serve communion. Don't you do it? No, I want to do that. What about that debate? Now, we don't like these verses because they speak a language that is foreign to our ear. It's the language of surrender. Surrender the responsibility for our care to God and let Him provide at His level while we do His will in seeking His kingdom. See, the problem is we don't want to accept what He will provide at His level, we want to provide at our level. And the difference between His level and our level is what causes the stress. And surrender the task of making ourselves right before God. I really appreciate when Paul says, you know, I don't care if you judge me. He said, I'm paraphrasing. He says, I don't care if you judge me, he says, to his critics. He says, I don't even judge myself. I pray to God to get me, Mike Mazzalongo, I pray to God to be able to get to the point where I can actually say that sincerely. Hey, I don't even judge myself. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of judging of myself that I do. And I suspect there might be some here who also fall into that category. And yet he says, I don't even judge myself. I don't care what you think of me. I don't even judge me. Why? Because Paul had surrendered the task of making himself right before God and had allowed the blood of Christ to be his only appeal to righteousness. He knew that if he stood before God and Satan said, you're going to let this guy in? This Paul guy, you're going to let him in? Don't you remember he's the one who, you know, he, he persecuted the saints, he put some of your best people in jail, he was responsible partly for the death of Stephen, he's a hypocrite, he's a liar, he's proud, he's... And the only answer that Paul says is, Lord, I throw myself on your mercy. Father, my only claim to goodness is the goodness that the blood of Christ gives to me. I have nothing to offer you except my faith. Nothing. I surrender completely the responsibility to be right with you. I surrender that to Christ. Nothing that I have can I offer to you. So surrender not only the responsibility of our care to God, surrender not only the task of making ourselves right before God, but also surrendering our bodies and our talents to the Holy Spirit and wait on His direction and wait on His power to build the kingdom and to prepare for the return of Jesus Christ. You know, we like to think in terms of success and that's not a bad thing. I'm not down on success. I'm not down on, come on, let's get things done. You know me. The problem with our thinking is that we try to interpret spiritual success in, in strictly worldly ways. Bigger, better, higher, faster. That's the Olympics. That's the world. Run faster, jump higher, hit the ball further. That, that, that's the Olympics. Nothing wrong with that. That's just the world. We don't judge our spiritual life in those terms. Faster, bigger, better. We don't, we don't do that. Striving for success in the kingdom of God means that we are in the process of continual surrender to God every single day. You know, Jesus set the tone for our Christian walk when He made this statement in Matthew 10. He said, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. 
he who has found his life shall lose it, and he who has lost it for my sake shall find it. What is he talking about losing your life? He's talking about surrendering it. If you're hanging on to your life here on earth you know, and gripping it, and nobody, you know, nobody's going to tear me away from this life, he said, you, you've already lost the thing that you think you're looking for. But if you surrender your life to Him, then you're going to find the thing that you're actually looking for, and you will receive it. You know, all of us who have begun the journey with Christ have actually begun a journey of surrender. Just in case you wondered, you know, what am I doing? What are we doing? What's this Christianity thing all about? Is it coming to church? Is that what I, what it, no. This here, this meeting here, this is just a means to an end. The end is I, as Brother Harold was leading the song, I surrender all. You know, I challenge you to make the prayer in the morning when you get up. You know, when you get out of bed there, you have to get out of bed and something has to happen when you get out of bed unless you're severely handicapped, most of us. We get out of bed, we turn and our two feet hit the ground first, right? We sit there, some of us longer than others. I challenge you from now on, every time you, you know, swivel around, the alarm clock goes, you hit it, boom, 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 you swivel around and your two feet hit the ground, stop. Don't get out of bed right away. Take 30 seconds to pray, a short one, and I'll tell you the prayer to begin with. Dear Lord, what is it that you want me to surrender to you today? I challenge you to make that prayer, because if you make that prayer, you're going to find out what he's asking you to surrender on that particular day. Because we only live one day at a time. And so all of us who have begun the journey with Christ have begun this journey of surrender. And this sermon is a kind of a reminder to us, hey, what are we doing here? This is what we're doing. We forget this as time, at times as the world and its riches and its cares tempt us to take control again. But our work as Christians, our task as disciples of Jesus is to surrender every thought, every care, everything to Christ every single day. Paul the Apostle says it best in Romans 12.1, he says, I adjure you brethren by the mercies of God to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. He could have said, I adjure you, brethren, by the mercies of God to surrender yourselves as a living sacrifice. Here on Sunday we do the public worship and that's fine, we've been called on to do that. It's edifying, it's encouraging. We make our witness to the world. We say to God, we love you God, as a group. But every single day, we don't have time to come here to do this. Every single day the task of Christianity is surrender. That's what it is. So for some, the journey has not even yet begun. You know, how fitting is it that Jesus' command for those who would surrender to Him to begin that journey by repenting of their sins, that's the surrender of will, you ever wondered, what, what is repentance? It's the surrender of your will. Not my will, your will, Lord. Not my will to do what I feel like doing, your will. Not my will, Lord, uh, uh, concerning any issue, your will. From now on, you know, some people think repentance, okay, I stopped swearing, drinking, smoking, I've got it down. No! Repentance is from now on, it's going to be your will, Lord. I surrender my will to your will. And the exercise of church and Bible class and reading our Bibles, you know, all the exercises of Christianity, they're simply there to open our eyes to what are those things we must surrender and how to do that surrender. 
Isn't it interesting also that the first physical act of our journey of surrender is to actually be buried in the waters of baptism? How natural that a, a life of surrender begins with surrendering ourselves into the arms of someone else who will then bury us into the waters of Christ and then bring us up again as new creatures, forgiven, first step of surrender taken. Baptism, the first act of surrender in a journey that will see us surrender everything in this life to Christ and then freely receive from Him everything that the life to come has to offer. If you need to surrender your life, if you need to surrender your sins, if you need to surrender your cares, if you need to surrender anything to Christ, then we invite you tonight to do this as we stand and as we sing our song of surrender. <laughs>